it's your boy GS Luke here for our DFS value picks for this week's Zurich Classic. It's an interesting week. We have teams rather than players, an interesting format with alternate shot and best ball. So a lot to consider here. But in this video specifically, we're going to be covering my top six value plays, which are going to be cheaper options on the DraftKings board to help open up salary, help you spend up for an extra stud or two, and of course, give you some of that ownership leverage. All these plays will be priced $7,600 and below. I raised it by $100 this week because there is somebody at $7,600 I really like. And again, of course, the goal here is to go after some of those diamonds in the rough to help you in these large field tournaments. So with that being said, let's go ahead and hop right on into it. All right, on the screen, you can see the Patreon projections. As always, if you want direct access to these spreadsheets, you know where to find them on my Patreon page. A link is down in the description for that. But the first value pick is going to be the combination of Kevin Kisner and Scott Brown at $7,600. I even bent the rules this week for the value picks video to go out and play. Just people who aren't coming in with the hottest of form. I mean, even Kevin Kisner hasn't had those flashy performances of late. And Scott Brown especially. This is somebody who's been playing on the Corn Ferry Tour for the last two to three months, has lost his status here. But if you take a look at their history as a pairing here at the Zurich Classic, you can see it's impeccable outside of last year. Last year, they missed the cut, which of course was the start of the bad run of play for Scott Brown, ended up losing his tour card there. But in 2019, finished fifth, second place in 2017, 15th in 2018. Pretty much every single time they've played together, they've had a ton of success. These are two borderline best friends. You can see, you know, Kevin Kisner's been decent of late, particularly in some of these weirder formats like what we had there at the WGC where he made it closer to the end. But miscut at the Heritage was definitely a little bit eye-opening. 44th at the Masters, also not his best stuff, but did play well at the player. So it's been a little bit of hit or miss play for Kevin Kisner. For Scott Brown, it's pretty, been, pretty much been all miss. But when we take a look at the shots gain metrics, it's not quite as ugly as what you would expect. Off the tee, he's a slight gainer to the field over his last 50 measured rounds. This is a relatively large sample size for Brown at this point, just a slight loser on approach and gaining to the field with the putter. So if we were just taking a look at the quote unquote big three stats, you know, of course the ball striking stats and putting, he looks like he's right around a tour average player, which really isn't all that bad, especially for this field specifically, where, you know, the average player in this field is much worse than what we usually have here on tour, but the around the green play has been really holding him back. And the one thing you can get away with at this golf course, specifically TPC Louisiana, is the around the green play. You're dealing with relatively flat greens. They're not raised. There's a few that are raised, but most of them are right around the level with the fairway. And as a result, the shots aren't very difficult, right? It's straightforward. You can either take it up high, you can take it down low if you need to. Uh, pretty much every single around the green shot will be at your disposal. So some of these guys like a Scott Brown that certainly aren't around the green specialist should be able to get away with it. And over the last 50 measure rounds, I get a large sample size. That is the only thing really holding them back. So Given that they've had success at this track and this venue in the past, um, and of course under these same type of formats, I would expect them to be a little bit underlooked. And at $7,600, they certainly give you a little bit of salary flexibility as well. So a high upside, of course, high risk play, just based on how Scott Brown at least has been playing of late. But I think the upside is there. And given their familiarity with each other are certainly a group of players I'm taking a look at. Next up, we have Bo Hostler and Sahith Agala, uh, the two poster boys for this video, of course, in the thumbnail image there. $7,500, so right around where I would usually start my value picks. And it really comes down to familiarity. These two players are both more jovial characters, you know, more lighthearted than anything. You can definitely tell that with Bo Hostler and Sahith Agala, just a lighthearted type of guy. So you can tell that they'd get along. And in junior golf days, and even in in collegiate days, they've played a ton of golf together. Now, they weren't on the same team. One was at Pepperdine, one was at University of Texas, but they would oftentimes play against each other, and these kind of created a friendship over time because they were the top-tier players when they were in college. It was more, you know, towards the end of Hosser's career and the beginning of Figala's career where they kind of had overlap there, but nonetheless, both of them were top-tier talents and have had that familiarity for quite some time. In terms of their games, both of them are up and coming. You know, Hosler has been around for a little bit longer than Figala, but is really starting to gain on approach, which has taken his game to the next level. He's always been a solid driver, always been a really good putter, um, particularly on these Poa Anua surfaces. And Sahith Figala, also more of a Poa specialist, so we are having that Poa Trivialist overseed this week. 
He's also been more of a hit or miss type of player, extremely volatile, you know, missing cuts week, maybe even a week or two at a time. Then going out there and posting top five, top 15 finishes, right? He was the leader at the Waste Management Phoenix Open for quite some time. So he definitely has flashed that upside in the past. And if they can catch a hot stretch of approach play, you can tell in terms of the shots gain profile, they really both struggle on approach, but around the green, they're solid. You know, Bo Hostler in a really good putter like we talked about before, and both relatively long off the tee. That should play well at this type of venue. You have really large fairways, the rough. It is substantial, but it's not like what we had at the API or US Open or any of those type of venues. Should They should be able to get away with it. I'm expecting them to have a solid week here and just up and coming players, you know, paired together. This would be a great spot for them to go out there, finish top five or even win for the first time. So certainly like them there at that price tag and think they bring a lot of upside to these large field tournaments. All right, and now moving on to our next group that is going to be Aaron Rye and David Lipsky, another group of PJ Tour newcomers, right? These guys have just got their card for the first time this year, but both have been pressed to this point, you know, much like the group that we just talked about. First off, Aaron Rye, he's been very solid with the ball striking. And David Lipsky, even though he's been extremely inconsistent, he's been first round leader a few times. He's cracked the top of the leaderboard more than once. You know, the second place at Congaree makes a lot of sense for the Palmetto Championship. And of course, over the last month or so, has also flashed towards the top of the leaderboard a few times. So you're looking at two of the more promising up and coming players. In terms of their shots gain profile, when you combine both of them, average them out, right around a neutral player in every category but approach. That's of course where they're really gonna make most of their hay this week, but off the tee, right around an average player. Same thing with around the green. That's pretty much what we're looking for, right? We're looking for complementary skill sets, guys that are gaining in one category where the other guy is losing. And then with the putter, a little bit to be desired by both of them, right? Losing right around 0.1 strokes per round when you put those two numbers together, which isn't ideal, but just in terms of their upside, in terms of if they can catch that hot putter, they could certainly do some damage here because of course, gaining on approach, um, they're one of the few groups in this range that is able to gain on approach. You can see there's quite a few that are severely in the red down there. Um, a few others that are gaining where you can see the Joel Damon, Steven Yeager group is a slight gainer right there, uh, mostly due to Joel Damon. But if you're looking for consistency from both parties, you're gonna get that from this Lipsky and Aaron Rye group. Off the tee, Rye's a significant gainer. He was more significant of a gainer about a month ago. He went through a few whole, I should say few event stretch where it wasn't really his best golf. Um, David Lipsky too, he's not the longest off the tee, but he's certainly accurate. So if you have one guy in Aaron Rye, that's going to be a solid gainer off the tee. And the other one that's at the very least precise, if they time up the holes correctly, you know, make sure, making sure they use Lipsky on some of the shorter holes, um, planning accordingly, they should be able to take advantage of that. So I do like their chances here. Of course, it's their first time playing in this type of venue. In terms of the recent form, you can see Rye had a 29th at the Valero, Texas. That's good to see. Uh, miscut for Lipsky there, but you can see the upside. Seventh place at Corrales Putacania, right? So this is just a popper, somebody who, when he has his best stuff, you certainly are going to want to have access there. And given that Aaron Rye has also flashed that same type of upside, certainly somebody I'm going to at $7,400. I also have my eye on the group of Matthew Neesmith and Taylor Moore. They're also at $7,400 and mostly Neesmith's ball striking and Taylor Moore's pedigree is what I'm betting on here. Now, if we take a look at Taylor Moore's PGA Tour stats, it has not been what we expected. He was one of the more consistent cut makers on the Corn Ferry Tour, but also a top 25 machine, which when you're taking a look at some of the more consistent players on the Corn Ferry Tour, that usually translates to success on the PGA Tour because we want these guys that are going to be consistent with the ball striking. And the one thing that's really helped more back has been the approach play. You can see over his last 50 measured rounds, losing close to a third of a stroke per round. Luckily, Matthew Neesmith is the exact opposite, gaining close to half a stroke per round. So in terms of a complementary skill set, I like to see that. They're both gaining off the tee, which is a solid from both of them. No matter who's driving, they should be able to get themselves in solid position. Around the green, they are slight gainer in both categories as well. And the putter, right around a neutral. So in terms of a shots gain profile, they're a very well-balanced, you know, very well-rounded team. You know, I'm not expecting them to go out there and bleed strokes in any one category. Sure, the putting isn't ideal. They're not gaining to the field, but that's also why they're in this $7,000 range. You can see when we start to get down to the 6K options here in a second, and it gets really ugly really fast. And to try and take some of these higher floor plays, particularly for a cash contest or for some of these single entries or smaller field GPPs, they are a great play for that format because I see them going out there and making the cut in terms of their ball striking, in terms of their consistency, should go out there and probably finish in the top 25 here at the very least. So certainly like their upside at $7,400, you're also getting 
really solid price tag on them you know they're not like a $6,500 golfer like we'd hope to get in one of these tournaments but uh you're gonna have to be a little bit more balanced this week I talked about it during the core picks video because we don't have so many plays in that 6k range we can go to we're gonna have to be a little bit more selective about the value that we're going to so it's going to be a core pick for me particularly in some of these smaller field tournaments like I said before but even in these large field GPPs if they can grab a hot putter they have more than enough upside with the ball striking to perhaps take this whole thing down. So they are somebody I'll have in these large field tournaments as well, uh, but just a little bit more intriguing, a little bit uh, of a better play for me in some of these smaller field tournaments. Next up, we're going to talk about Doc Redman and Sam Ryder. They're at $7,100, and this is an extremely volatile group. So it's a little bit of a skill set dilemma as well, where you're really trying to put together players that are you know bad at one thing, but good at the other. Um, both of them relatively bad off the tee, so that's really the huge area of concern. But on approach, you have that complementary skill set where Redman is gaining on approach, whereas Sam Ryder is losing. Of course, Sam Ryder, no... Uh, he's not scared to go out there and hoop shots. We've seen him make so many hole outs. I believe it was 16 the last time we counted for this year alone. So uh, I know he's a loser for most of his shots on approach, but certainly an aggressive iron player, which plays well for the best ball format. On in terms of around the green play, you have a gainer in Sam Ryder, where Doc Redman really struggles in that category. So perhaps he'll be able to pick him up whenever he fails in that category. In terms of the putter, they both gain. So it's just another interesting conglomeration of the stats there, where they're only really losing in one category, that being the off the tee play. You know, really solid on approach, relatively solid around the green. Uh, you know, obviously trying to put aside Doc Redman, losing close to half a stroke per round around the green. Hopefully that's not sustainable, right? Hopefully he just went through a little bit of the yips there because over the last two to three events, I mean, even at the player championship, right? Top 10 performance there is really solid for Doc Redman. So I think he's trending in the right direction. If he can clean that up a little bit around the green, take them from a negative in that category to a positive, you know, the off the tee play is never really going to be a strong suit for either of these players. But because this isn't, you know, a 77, 7,800 yard golf course, they should be able to get away with it if the other categories are there, right? They're not going to gain to the field off the tee. And obviously that might hinder their upside, might not make them, you know, a play to go out there and win this week. But if you're playing in these small field tournaments, you know, much like a Matthew Neesmith and Taylor Moore, they're going to be bringing you that consistency, you know, that top 25 finish that you're looking for. And at $7,100, you know, just in this value range in general this week, uh, that's really all you're looking for. It's just going to be hard to find those guys down low that are actually going to go out and win this thing. Over the years, it's always been one of those really strong groups that has won this event. Now, you're going to have a few guys down low that might crack the top 10. You always have that one really surprise group that comes completely out of nowhere and takes the whole thing down. But if you're playing core picks, you know, taking 15 to 20 percent ownership on these guys, you know, like I'm implying by making them a core value pick, uh, you don't want to be taking shots on guys that are coming in with no form, right? We will at least want some light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm going to somebody like a Doc Redmond and Sam Ryder, who at the very least have had some decent performances over the last few months, have that complementary skill set that we're looking for. Um, we can be a little bit more aggressive in how much of we were, how much of them that we're playing. And now, lastly, the last pair I want to talk about is going to be Alex Smalley and Hayden Buckley. Um, Alex Smalley really impressed at the Corrales Puticanya Championship, almost ended up winning that thing. It was in contention for quite some time. And Hayden Buckley, particularly in the fall swing of this year, um, early on, Sanderson Farms ended up finishing second place there really impressed i mean was the leader after the first two rounds there on um, the ball striking he was gaining close to half a stroke per round off the tee and on approach has kind of cooled down a little bit so if we take a look at the shots gain metrics you can see both of them are still gaining significantly off the tee in fact they're one of the best groups in the entire field when it comes to shots gained off the tee on approach Payne Buckley is still a gainer, but he certainly calmed down from what we saw early in the year. If, we're, were, if we were to include Alex Smalley's approach stats for the Corrales Putacanya, he would be a positive. So um, I'm going to count them as a positive in that category. Both of them are relatively solid on approach and off the tee. Around the green is an issue for both of them. But like I said before with Scott Brown, some of these other players that aren't the best around the green. You can kind of get away with it here, right? Even if both of them don't have their best stuff around the green, we're hoping that they're not putting themselves in trouble to begin with, right? We're hoping that the off the tee play and the approach play is going to give them a ton of birdie looks. Um, and really just an alternate shot is where it's going to matter, right? They're going to have to have a good alternate shot round on Friday and on Sunday to win this thing. But it is certainly possible because their putter, while it's not a huge strong suit for them, they have been 
They've shown the ability to pop. At the Corrales Putikanu Championship, Alex Molly went out there, gained a ton of strokes to the field with the flat stick. And then, of course, with Hayden Buckley in the fall swing, when he was in contention at the Sanderson Farms, he made more than enough putts as well. So certainly pop putters, very solid ball strikers. And, you know, much like some of the other picks we've talked about here, when they have that ball striking down, when they have that complementary skill set where both of them are just insanely good ball strikers, they're not going to put themselves in much trouble to begin with. And at a golf course with as flat greens as we have here at TPC Louisiana, I'm expecting them to, at the very least, get away with the round of green play. The putter might not necessarily cooperate. Uh, they might not make enough putts to go out and compete at this event. But at the very least, I see them going out there and making the cut, if not finishing in the top 15. All right, that's all I've got here for the DFS value picks. Before we hop on out of here, go ahead and let me know what your top value pick is is in the comments. I'd love to hear from you guys. Just make sure they're priced $7,600 and below. I'll give you that extra 100 because I took it for this week as well. And it's hard to pick values this week. I mean, just with the field strength, with a lot of these people that we haven't seen for quite some time, it's hard to identify some of these values down low. And that's why the cheapest value I had was there at $7,000, right? You know, usually I'm one of the people more willing to go down to 65 or even $6,300. But in this field, it's just, it's really tough to do. There's not anyone down there I really see myself playing. So go ahead and let me know who you have down below. And if you have anybody in that 6K range that you are comfortable getting to, uh, let's say in more than 15% of your lineups, let me know who they are because at this point, I don't have any that I have in my player pool. So if you do, I would love to hear that as well. I appreciate all the support here, guys. If you haven't already liked the video, make sure you do that as well. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't already to the GS Luke DFS channel. We're posting tons of golf content, whether it's for DraftKings, prize picks. We have showdown content, course breakdowns, pretty much everything you're looking for in terms of golf, at least fantasy golf content, right? So I appreciate you guys. Again, thank you for stopping by. I'll see you guys next time.